uh, for, for the long, a long time. I was committed to Georgia, and then uh, some things happened, and uh, I kind of reopened my recruitment a little bit and uh, reevaluated. And uh, I think God wanted me to be here in Oxford, and, uh, and, that, and that's where I am, and I'm really blessed to be here for sure. We knew that, that we had a really, really good opportunity coming in uh, with the number number one uh, ranked team coming into Oxford, and so uh, we really wanted to make, make a statement and uh, get some momentum here in Oxford, you know, and so uh, everybody really likes to, to, to see what I did, but it's, I can't do it by myself, you know, and so uh, to, if you go back and watch the film, there's the O-line strained all night, you know, they really gave us a push when we needed to, and, and Jerrion and Snoop had a really, really big night drawing the defense to them, and so um, when I when I pulled the ball, uh, made it really really easy on me with the with the receivers blocking downfield for me and everything. And so, um, good team effort. We just kind of we, we came up short. You, you kind of you just kind of say a little prayer for them. You know, I, I saw it before uh, our game started. We hadn't left the hotel in Tupelo yet, uh, headed to Oxford. And so I was I was watching the game and um, I saw he went down. And then I saw later in the game the ambulance showed up. And so I uh, just said a little prayer for him because you know. Being in this situation, uh, he's a really, really good player. I think everybody can see that. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a tough situation to be in. You know, when you get injured, when he's having such a great year, and you hate to see it. Um, but I know that uh, his identity isn't in football. I think, uh, I think that everybody can see that his identity is in Christ. And so I think uh, um, he's going to bounce back and, and recover quickly, and hopefully uh, see him do big things. Uh, when baseball season rolls around, that we can be prepared and not be so far far behind the ball um, and we can catch up pretty quickly and so we've been working at it um, mo mainly right now we're really focused on football though since we're in football season but uh, just keeping the rust off really our, our swings is there more pressure on you playing the piano or or trying to deal with uh, Derek Brown and, and the Auburn defense uh I don't know I think it kind of helps you in both ways you know and uh, being able to perform you know Growing up, I've always been a, a, a performer, whether it be on the football field or the baseball field or whatever I was doing or, or in the, uh, performing in front of people at a concert or piano. And so um, I've always liked to be in front of people and, and uh, show them what I can do and, and display the blessings that God has uh, bestowed upon me. And so um, I, think, I think they're probably about even, you know, they're not, they're not much far apart. <laughs> well, I have to... I ha uh, I have to hand it to you. I mean, you, you blow me away here with some of these answers. The slate is set for Saturday. It begins at 12, runs all the way to uh, midnight. Nightcap, Tennessee at Missouri. Big game for the balls. So the LSU Tigers continue to uh, entertain us both on and off the field. The latest involving uh, Michael Divinity. We'll find out what's going on there. Brody Miller covers the beat for The Athletic. Brody, thank you. Great to have you on. Uh, can you please tell us what's going on uh, with uh, this latest off the field situation, especially with Divinity? Good afternoon. Hey, hey how are you doing? Yeah, so it's a situation where – you know, I mean, obviously he left the team, as you know, the week of the Alabama week. Um, and, and, you know, Ed Ogeron said it was for personal reasons and whatnot, which is kind of a, a vague reason they give for a lot, of, a lot of, you know, different issues that can mean a wide range of things. Now that he's back, you know, Ed Ogeron said on, his, uh, on the radio this week and on his teleconference this week that, you know, he, he will, he's back on the team, but he will not be able to play. He, he gave the date of the earliest and being able to return would be a hypothetical national championship game which kind of confirms what most of us had been hearing around this beat that, I mean, he was going to be suspended for about six games for disciplinary reasons. He was, he was already suspend, um, planned to be suspended or held out for, for three games this season before this latest issue. And uh, now, it, you know, now it was going to be six games. And now they, I think they're bringing him back, which really, I think really comes down to more of a want to help the kid out, want him to be around the team, think that would be better for him, better for, you know, preparing for the draft and the NFL and all these things of actually, you know, working with the team every day. Also, I think it will help the team in a lot of ways, having, you know, one of the more vocal IQ guys on the team kind of around every day. But, I mean, it's, a, it's still a fluid situation. I don't think anything is completely ironed out, but Michael Divinity is not expected to play anytime soon. So uh, I saw something that he could be eligible if – 
LSU makes it to the national championship game. Is that possible? Yes, that is what Ed Ogeron said on the teleconference this week, which goes back to, you know, from the date that he was taken off the team, it was a, it was going to be a, he was going to be held out for six more games this okay. season, which would line up with the timeline of national championship game. That's being optimistic, I guess. Um, Brody Miller <laughs> joining us. Uh, Brody, let's let's talk about the where LSU is, and we all we all know they're number one in the country, but the the attacks on the defense are coming fast and furious from from our brethren in the national media and you cover this team uh we, I know I know there've been some 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 dropouts uh, including divinity but what's going on with Dave Aranda's defense it's really tricky right and it's been hard to pin down because there are so many areas where this defense has been fantastic and so many spots where you have to have to give them credit. You know, shutting out Florida the final 25 minutes of that game. I mean, Auburn's not a great offense, but you know, holding them consistently all game in a top-10 matchup. I think you have to give them a lot of credit for the fact that they, they held Alabama to six points of offense on, a, on, for what it's worth, a kind of fluky touchdown in the first half and two yards per carry. You know, they have spots where they look really great. And then they have spots, you know, where they gave up 28 in the second half to Alabama. You have... You know, they had a 28-3 lead on Ole Miss, and Ole Miss just broke explosive play after explosive play. And then you go back to, you know, Texas scored every drive of the second half. Vanderbilt had a few explosive plays. You know, it's just kind of an, a hot or cold defense, and I tend to give them the benefit of the doubt of saying this is an LSU team that, compared to all the other top teams in the country, has played far more, you know, top 10, top tier games this season. So it's a little tough to go by, you know, aggregate stats when you're looking at that when it's like, Okay, you know, you just played Alabama and Auburn in two straight games. You might you might get a little sloppy against an Ole Miss. You know, it's a little tricky to to be too harsh on them. I think they're really good at stopping the run in the middle. They they have a really good outside defense. You know, in terms of the perimeter of stopping. You know, with with Christian Fulton and Derek Stingley. Their main problem is they allow explosive plays. That's been the key thing all season. And I think that goes to some tackling issues, maybe a little bit of fatigue issues where this up-tempo offense has a factor in there. I think there's a lot of things going that are kind of coming together to make this happen, but I just tend to prefer to judge a defense by how it looks in the games where it's really locked in, and I think it's a it's a good defense. It's not a great one. It's not as good as Ohio State's, Clemson's, or, or Georgia's or any of these teams, but it's a, I think it's a top 25 defense. Let's talk about the final two games of the season. I mean, it, this is always a, a predictable stretch. Uh, there have been years when the LSU Arkansas game was much anticipated. I, I, I have to give Ed Ogeron credit. I mean, he he said with a straight face how excited he is and his players are for this game Saturday night. Um, you've covered a lot of college football. I mean, this is one of the worst matchups I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, the spread, uh, the opening spread was the largest, I believe, in SEC history or in 40 years. It was 46. Now it's around 44 points. I mean, this is as ugly as it gets. You have an LSU team that's dominated people for the most part as much as anyone. You have an Arkansas team that you've been around the SEC more than me, but it's got to rank relatively highly up there on, on weakest in the SEC history. I think Ed Ogeron's kind of gotten pretty good at knowing what buttons to press with this team and kind of what to say in the media and those things. So, for example, the Ole Miss game after that game, past years I think Ed Ogeron would get really, really hard on his team after that game, but he knew, okay, team's already pretty mad at itself right now. He also knows they just came off Alabama. Ed Ogeron was actually really positive after that game of being like, hey, they're already going to be hard enough on themselves. I'm happy they won. So I think this week he knows this is a game where it is really easy to overlook out Arkansas, really easy to start thinking about all these things like the SC title game, college football playoff. I think this time he's using the Ole Miss game and what happened in that second half to be like, all right, you can't overlook this. You can, and I think you'll actually see LSU kind of go out and, and dominate this game, at least in the first half. Uh, talking uh, about uh, LSU's finish, and, and, and I, I would think even next week, uh, I mean, I know there's a lot of revenge on, on LSU's mind about the A&M game, but A&M is a pretty tricky team. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, A&M's really – it's a, it's it's not that different from how teams you have to talk about Auburn, where I think a lazy spectator will look at their record and say, you know, they're not any good. But if you look at things like SP Plus or any of those metrics, I mean, I, they are a, I think in terms of just overall scheme of things, I think they're probably a top 25 caliber football team. They just have an absolutely brutal schedule. So they look a lot worse than they are. I'm not saying A&M's particularly great or going to give LSU a major threat. I'm sure LSU will be a 18-point favorite or something in that realm. But – that's a, that's a tough team, and Jimbo Fisher, despite what you might think of him, he, 
he, he's one of the coaches that has proven he can have success against Dave Aranda. He's a coach that you never can really underestimate, and I think A&M has enough talent to make that game game tricky. And as you said, I think it's a game where you throw all the all the rules out. I mean, there's going to be so much animosity in that game Saturday. You start with the seven-overtime game, right? Then you go to the post-game scuffle and the fight after the game between right. these teams. Then you, then you go to the – then you go to Dave Aranda almost going to Texas A&M a year and a half ago and them trying to steal him. Then you go to some of the really intense recruiting battles between these two schools, like for Terrace Marshall. Then you go to the fact that LSU just stole Texas A&M's athletic director and Scott Woodward. So, I mean, there is just so much, you know, just tension building up between these programs. And, you know, I, I think it's funny how a year ago I think everyone was trying to force this rivalry, but it's, it's pretty clearly a rivalry right now. So next, that, that game's going to be tricky. Uh, kind of on a different subject, and, and I realize uh, he's long gone, but I kept thinking about uh, Joe Oliva the other day. Uh, you know, he, he, dealt with, he dealt with Tom Herman and, and, and really got tired of being played and essentially let Tom Herman go to Texas. And now I hear from sources out there, the players are bailing, recruits are bailing, uh, disgruntled uh, fans are – or boiling, and and his controversial choice at Ogeron is heading toward a national coach of the year honors and maybe a national championship. Does does Joe Oliva get a uh, uh, at least a, a gold star for 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 all that he did? <laughs> yeah, history's surprisingly been pretty kind to Joe Oliva. Eh? Yeah, I, I think he does. I mean, he's he, I think he's just chilling in Florida right now and gets to kind of enjoy being right on this one. It's. I mean, he is as criticized of an athletic director in the SEC over the past four years and his time, past few years while at LSU for a long list of things, more than just coaching hires. And, and this was probably, that's the number one thing that was always pinned to him was how that whole, you know, 2015 and 2016 coaches searches got messed up. And, and all of a sudden now, I, I don't, I don't know if he was saying day one, Ed Ogeron's my guy. And that's who I, you know, we, we all read Ross Dellinger's fantastic breakdown from, uh, Sports Illustrated. I mean, I don't think he was going out day one saying, I want Ed Ogeron over Tom Herman, but I give him credit. He had the foresight to say, this situation's tricky. I don't really trust what's going on with either, you know, with Tom Herman and also the Jimbo Fisher situation. He, he, he trusted Ed Ogeron. He saw some things, and I don't think it just fell into his lap. I do think he actually had faith in Ed Ogeron, and it's paying off. I mean, I, none of us could have predicted this, but give Joe Oliva credit. And, and one last thing, Brody, he also stuck with Will Wade, who uh, not only has a top uh, 25 team, but he is packing the stands, especially on the road, because students love to come out and root against him. <laughs> yeah, that is one way to view it. Yeah, I'm not sure if he was necessarily, you know, Mr. Will Wade in his corner. No, or I'm just like kidding that, about but, that. But yeah, <laughs> but he, yeah, but no, yeah, you're right. He he didn't, you know, he, he did stick with him and he did reinstate him. And I don't know if necessarily Joe Leva gets the credit for all no. that. But hey, it's it's I, out. listen, I I, I just. Wanted for the first time in my career to say something positive about Joe Oliva, so I've now officially I'm done it. I'm with you. I'm with you. <laughs> hey, Brody, uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks for the great coverage. We will uh, see you in a couple of days. All right. Thanks for having me. Take care. Great to have you on. Brody Miller from The Athletic. Uh, yeah, Will Wade uh, was uh, got a bit of a rude awakening a week ago when he went back to uh, VCU. If you uh, didn't see about it, I think you can uh, check out the FBI Most Wanted list and find his picture. Uh, We'll take a break. More to come. More of your phone calls right after this. Amy, go right ahead. Hello. Hey, Paul. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Well, the reason I was calling is that um, do you feel like that Mac Jones has been sort of maligned in his abilities because he hasn't actually had to step up to a certain level? But I think that given the chance that he will actually perform, what do you Listen, think? Uh, I mean, he's a backup quarterback, and uh, you know, there's, there's, it's not like uh, he's on the same level as Tua. Tua was a standalone quarterback. He was, he's only considered to be the greatest quarterback in Alabama history. Now that is true, but I just um, feel like now that he's had this opportunity, although it was um, gotten by, you know, an unfortunate circumstance, that maybe he will rise above what everybody thinks of him listen I, I don't know what he's going to do uh but you know he has the opportunity of his life against auburn if he wins if he can if he can pull that game out he he'll become a, a generational hero assuming alabama gets into the playoffs and maybe even wins yeah, the title if he loses um well, 
what can you do? I mean, I mean, when you're the quarterback at Alabama, you, you get all the credit, and you are going to get the blame. That is true. But I'm thinking if you are also the quarterback at Alabama, then there must have been something about you that caught Nick Saban's eye, or otherwise you wouldn't be there. So I'm well, thinking listen, that maybe uh, he just needs that chance. Yeah, um, don't forget, uh, a year ago he was the third-string quarterback behind Jalen Hurts and – and, and Tua, I mean, he took a chance. He was a four-star quarterback that had great ability, um, and he may still. I mean, I, I don't know. I've only seen him in one, one and a half games, and he looked really good against Ar- <coughs> really good against Arkansas, but everyone's looked good against Arkansas. Andre is up next in the ATL. Hey, Andre. Coach, you know, I, I got to call you out, Coach. I don't want to, but I got to. Go ahead. You know, I, 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 I slammed on break early, and you were talking to that old Miss fan, and you were telling him what you were thinking about uh, what old Miss was going to do next year. And I'm looking at the cards, and I'm trying to see where they're going. They play in the SEC West. Who are they going to pass? They're going to pass Alabama. They're going to pass LSU. They're going to pass Auburn. Are they going to pass Texas A&M? Where are they going, Coach? Well, uh, you don't know. Uh, they're probably going past Mississippi State if they can beat them. Uh, they're, they're moving past <laughs> Arkansas. I mean, you, yeah, listen, it's a tough right. neighborhood. Uh, you can't just uh, – you can't go too fast. But, oh. you know, Ole Miss's expectations are different than, 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 than most. Okay, Coach, if I read between the lines, what you're telling me is they're a middle of the pack team in the SEC West. Without yeah, exa- saying it, that's what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's fair. Okay, well, in other words, they're not going anywhere. Stop, Coach, you should have backslapped that fan and told him, listen, man, you're playing the toughest division in college football. Be happy in the middle of the pack. But anyway, Coach, thanks for taking my call, and I always enjoy your show. Thank you, Andre. Appreciate that. Let's uh, continue with more phone calls. And Ron is in Louisiana. Hello, Ron. How you doing, Mr. Feinbaum? Hope you're enjoying New York. I am. Thank you. Uh, Yes, I have two things. I just want to, in a little defense of LSU's defense, they haven't had their number ones actually play with each other in any game this year so far. That's just a small excuse. But as of last Saturday, I have never seen such a horrible defense from them in my entire life. The dang line scrimmage, the defensive line looked like a bunch of fat dudes running around there. And next thing you know, you look right behind them, and there's not one linebacker back there. Like, where do they go? You know, they just look horrible. But the other question I have is is that I wanted to know, when LSU played Auburn, you know, the scores were really close, but they had over five. Hey, Ron, let me, let me, I, I apologize. We, we got you a little uh, trip. Up the East Coast. I'd like to know if there's anything you don't do well. I mean, you're a really great <laughs> baseball player. You're a great quarterback. You're a musician. Tell us about your uh, musical skills. Um, I've been playing piano uh, since I was in the second grade. What a great interview. Too bad the guy played for Ole Miss. Lee is up next. Uh, hey, Lee, go right ahead. Hey, Paul. I tell you what, Lee, uh, hold the thought. I, I, I apologize. We're, we're, I don't want to uh, crowd you. Don't go anywhere. We're- but I just decided I would call you today and see if I could get through and that I saw that young man from North Mississippi. Texas A&M is one of the 25 best teams in the country, but they won't be ranked if they were to lose those last Yeah, games. I mean, they, they, they have played literally everyone. And here's, here's something else I'm going to tell you. I, I don't think Alabama's going to make the playoff. I think Oregon's going to go jump them. But this is what's going to happen. You heard it here. Oregon goes in the Arizona State and gets knocked off. He's a Georgia grad. There we go. Don't make me start barking in here, Paul. <laughs> Are you finally at least drinking a little Mullinay? Would you like to hear my coach? Would you like to hear my coach O imitation? I would. Thank you. Oh, go Tigers, Paul. You got a great show. You're the number one SEC leader, Paul. Keep it up. You know, in the last 48 hours, he has said that Ray Tanner did talk to FSU and that Ray Tanner did not talk to FSU. I've put in two requests to talk to Bob Cass, and he won't talk to me. He's talking to everybody else in the state. Clemson leads in the series 70, 42, and 4, including a 51 to 32 street advantage in Columbia. That is unacceptable. And, and frankly, it's more fun to, to watch the end of a game on Twitter than it is 
from one of the networks. Can you say that one more time, Paul? I don't no, think I heard uh, Here's the way to get on this show. Say that the host of the show is the best you've ever seen. We'll put you right on the board. We promise you, if you say only good things about the host, we will share your tweets with the audience. We are uh, one day removed from the college football playoff rankings, part three, and uh, we're expecting a conversation momentarily with the executive director of the college football playoff, Bill Hancock. That's always uh, one of the highlights of this week. Uh, We'll talk to him in a minute. Reggie is in Kentucky. Uh, Hey, Reggie. Hey, Paul. Uh, I haven't called you since the basketball tournament last year. That's when I was bragging upon Auburn, and that was two games before they played Kentucky. I wish wow. I'd have been wrong about that, but we see where Auburn ended up. They had quite a year. <laughs> but the um, <clears throat> reason I called, uh, I do want to remember, I tried Monday and Tuesday and couldn't get through, Tua and, fam- and his family. I uh, want to remember them in prayer. And, Paul, this is something that I have not heard from anybody. I've watched a lot of stuff. Um, I'm so glad that was not a cheap shot that took him out. It was a football play. It was. It was. And I have never heard anybody say that. But, you know, if somebody would have cheap shot him and hurt him for the rest of his life, maybe, that would have been a shame. That would have been awful. No, that you're right. And, and listen, uh, I've seen the play as you have. Um, it's a case of, I think, his ankle getting in the way. He, he knew he was about to get hit. He couldn't get rid of the ball. He tried to avoid uh, a serious hit, and, and he went down. And it's just, uh, you know, the only thing I'll say positively, though, is that the, the doctors are, up, are upbeat. Now, listen, uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if they would be downbeat. I mean, they just got through doing a – a complicated Absolutely. surgery. Um, there, there were no after. I mean, sometimes things can can happen during surgery. Yes. Uh, the expectation is good uh, in terms of where he'll end up. You know, he'll lose money, but if you're a good NFL quarterback, it's it's not the first contract that that makes you rich. It's it's the second contract where you where you cash in. Thank you very much for the call, Reggie. Always a pleasure to welcome our next guest to the program. Bill Hancock is the executive director of the college football playoff. Uh, Bill, uh, great to have you back on the program. Paul, one of the many things I enjoy about college football season is our weekly conversation. Well, so it's, good to hear uh, from you. You bet. It's always fun for me to, uh, to get to sit back, put my feet up, and listen to you tell us exactly what happened in that room over the weekend. So uh, what were the big topics of conversation? You know, I think this time, I, I don't I don't have a timer in my hand, but I think the committee spent uh, as much time as anything this time on uh, on that, that Alabama, Oregon, Utah kind of segment of the group. Uh, that's my feeling about this week. So we 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 know we know that we know the protocol. We know what they're basing their vote on, but help us better understand. Because Tua got hurt before the half, so we had a half of Tua, a pretty significant half, 35-7, to seven, and then a little bit of Mac Jones. So what, what are they telling us by putting Alabama ahead, at least for now, over Utah and especially Oregon? Well, just uh, telling us that the, uh, the, the games, they're the 60-minute games, of course. Uh, mm-hmm. You wouldn't have the committee rank on on halves. I mean, look at the uh, look at the Oklahoma Baylor uh, half versus half, and you could have a debate like that over over a lot of different games during the season. Uh, fact is, Alabama's uh, resume to this to this uh, date uh, was was strong, and then turned them the knot over over Oregon. We we know that Oregon has a has a potential conference championship game, or Utah does. Um, can you explain to the audience? I know you've done it before. The importance of that conference championship versus a team that will be home watching. Well, it's, it's significant, um, 
as we talked before, the, the committee is instructed to use four tiebreakers if it sees the teams as comparable, and those are head-to-head results against common opponents, schedule strength, and conference championships won. So those are not weighted. Uh, it's up to each committee member to decide uh, which is uh, which is more important in his or her mind. But those conference championships, uh, that that's really important. So if, if, if the two Pac-12 schools are one spot behind Alabama, right now the committee is saying Alabama is ahead of them. So what, are we, what, what should we draw in if we move this uh, conversation ahead two weeks and Alabama has an 11-1 record and Oregon has a conference championship? Well, those of us in the room don't speculate. It's not our job to, to project that. I didn't ask you about speculate. I'm just telling you, what, what, what does that mean? Well, it means conference championships are important, and okay. it means that that folks can folks need to read into that what they will. Um, but we still have three weeks, three more weeks of ball ahead. Okay. So, like you said, let's sit back, put our feet up, and watch what happens on the field. Can't wait, uh, Bill. Let me ask you about uh, something that happened last night on the show. Reese Davis uh, questioned Rob Mullins, the chairman of the committee, about his own school. Oregon. Now, now we've, we've, we've talked about this ad nauseum that uh, there are always conflicts in the room. We've had them before. And the chairman goes outside, I, I suppose, when Oregon is being discussed. Uh, do I have that correctly? Yes, he goes out of the room. Does he have to, like, go to a certain place? Uh, or he can, can he wander around? Or does he, does he have to go to timeout? <laughs> oh man through the years and not on this committee but i have wanted to put a few folks uh, in timeout during my career not ever you paul not ever no. you no um but <laughs> there's a room out there are we have there are four rooms in a row where the committee uh, has the space available and uh, he just goes into one of those other rooms and uh, i don't know what they do out there i've never been out there with them uh, I assume they uh, read the paper or they check their email or whatever. I don't know. But they, they wait nearby, and then when, when it's time to bring them back, um, someone goes and gets them and says, okay, we're, we're finished with that segment, so come back. And then they come back in, and then the chair tells them uh, or somebody in the room tells them what happened while they were out to, to bring them up to speed. And, and, and in fairness, what, uh, he's not the only one that has to go out. No, he's not. He's not. Uh, through the years, you remember when Gene Smith had to go out for Ohio State. Uh, Dan Radakovich spent a lot of time out of the room when Clemson, when he was uh, when when he was on the committee from Clemson. Uh, Joe Castiglione, Frank Beamer. We've had through the six years, lots of people have have had to go out of the room, and it's, it's so, the right thing to do. That recusal policy has served us well, and like you and I talked before, it's. The, it's essentially the same policy that the NCAA uh, basketball committee uses. Except, I mean, we may or may not be heading toward uh, a confrontation where it comes down to Oregon. I mean, they have to win out. We know that. Uh, and, and maybe another school. And, and, and in that case, clearly, Bill, you, 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 you watch this every week. The, the media is going to ask a lot of questions. And, and, and the issue I, I, I think we all see moving forward is, what is Rob supposed to say? I mean, how, how is he the best person in the end to try to explain theoretically, and I know you don't want to go there, but I will, uh, why Oregon got in or didn't get in over another school? Well, we were prepared to answer those questions last night. Rob did his ESPN interview with Reese and the, and the guys that I know you heard. Um, Rob can answer questions about Oregon when, when he's asked. Uh, based on what the committee told him. And then after the ESPN interview, we have another layer of interviews, which is a, a telephonic interview with the press. And uh, uh, we answered every question that was asked last night about Oregon. Uh, I was prepared to go into even greater detail myself than, than, than Rob did on TV. Um, interestingly, we didn't get the questions last night. I don't know whether people just didn't think of it, didn't weren't tuned in or what, but we, we know we have a responsibility to answer questions from the press. 
and we're going to do that. And 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 you know, some have wondered about the answers that that, that are given, though. Uh, I mean, it's, and, and I'm not looking to uh, you know reopen old wounds here, but uh, some of us feel like we're not really getting much from Rob Mullins. Well, you know, I've heard people say that, and I'm always puzzled about that. You and I have had deeper conversations about this um, in the past, and you know, I much respect I have for you, and I enjoy those conversations. But we, you know, we 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 were prepared, and I think Rob did this yesterday to talk about the Alabama Oregon matter. Alabama's only loss was to our number one team, and really dominated its opponents. And no one other than LSU has come close to beating Alabama. And uh, Oregon lost to uh, to another good team, our number one team, uh, Auburn. Um, so I, the, those those summarize the committee's discussions, and the, the, there's not much else to report there. The, the two no, got a lot got a lot of conversation. Of course, it did. My goodness, um, somebody loses a player of that caliber, and the committee talks about it. But it just didn't affect Alabama's uh, resume to the extent that the committee thought they should move, uh, move down this week. I want to ask you, and I, I, I know that you you were busy yesterday. Um, and I don't expect you to pay attention to every interview that's, that's made, but we had Tim Brando on this program. I think you're familiar with Tim's background, certainly, uh, a, a major voice in college sports for many, many years. And he said a couple of things and I just want to give you, uh, the gist of what he said, and, and, and hopefully you would react. He said teams that are considered blue bloods, teams that have had success in the last 30, 35, 40 years, multiple conference championships, this cabal of teams that have made this event the great Sun Belt Invitational. <laughs> <laughs> he went on to say, <laughs> if I can tell you in July – that these are your teams, and I'm going to be right on at least three of the four that I name, then we've removed all of the joy of the regular season of college football. And you know, he, he said, he went on to say the CFB playoff committee has all their cronies on TV all day preparing everyone for Alabama privilege tonight. There's no doubt that they'll, they'll only drop one or two spots. The committee will claim the eye test and forget that non-conference con- schedule an embarrassment, I dropped them five spots. And obviously what he said the committee would do was right on the nose. Uh, you, I asked you one uh, two weeks ago about Stephen A. Smith, and uh, I did ask him on the air about you, and he said I was foolish for listening to you. Um, I don't know what you want to say about <laughs> Tim Brando's response, but I think we're all ears. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm laughing because I've known Tim ever since uh, before he left CBS back in the day. And um, – Cabal. I don't know. I don't know that cabal means what he thinks it means. <laughs> anyway, um, I don't. I just. I don't know what to say. I mean, cronies. Uh, <laughs> that's just. That's just not even close to true. The committee. You, you've been in the mocks. Uh, you've seen how it works. The mock exercises where you you come and portray the role of committee member. The committee member analyzes every team side by side, up and down, sideways. And comes out with the rankings. And there's just no bias, no regional stuff there. What did you say he said about SEC? Uh, oh, well, he, well, he called it the Sun. He called it the Sun Belt Invitational. Sun Belt Invitational. Uh, just wrong. I thought I thought Stephen A. Smith was wrong, as I told you a couple of weeks ago. And this is equally wrong. <laughs> oh my. Well, listen, I, I just, uh, you know, you came from the newspaper background, and, and so did I, and we've had those conversations long into the night, and I just felt like uh, if somebody was on this program talking about your your group, I wanted to give you the opportunity to respond. I appreciate that. Always do. <laughs> Next week, I don't know who I'll be quoting, but I'm sure I'll have somebody here, Bill. Uh, <laughs> Socrates or Plato or William Faulkner. It's- that yeah, you know, I, I always get confused between uh, Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato. I know there was a succession there, but uh, uh, yeah, for anyone out there. One of them, I but, think, Paul, one was an offensive guard, I believe. Yeah, and uh, 
Plato was a five star, I think. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Bill, come back soon, I hope. Okay, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I never. I didn't think I'd get Bill to laugh that much, but Timmy B has done it again. We are going to take a break. Back with much more. You know, we got several injuries in the game. You know, Raekwon, DJ Dale, Henry Ruggs will all be questionable, you know, for this game this week. And, you know, of course, everybody's talked a lot about the Tua situation. And look, you know, we lost a great leader, uh, a great player on our team, and we're all hurting because of it. And uh, just like any time you lose somebody in your family, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, everybody in the family is hurting. And this is all about people, and this is all about the person. Um, and, you know, we're pleased that the surgery went successfully, you know, today, and they expect him to have a full recovery. Um, look, I've talked to Tua. I, I'm, I feel bad. I'm hurting. All right, but so I call him on Saturday night to cheer him up. He cheers me up. I call him last night because I've been sitting in that room for 10 hours yesterday watching film. I call him to cheer him up. He cheers me up. Uh, so this is a guy that has great spirit. Uh, he's very positive uh, about just about everything he does and the effect that he has on other people. Uh, I think he's been a you know, great ambassador for college football in terms of the class that he shows and the way he goes about what he does and how he affects other people. Uh, and I don't think there's any way that any of us can say we won't miss that spirit uh, that he has. And, you know, the first thing he says to me last night when I tell him good luck in your surgery tomorrow is he said, well, I just can't wait to get back and see the game on Saturday. So, you know, it's also senior day. Um, this group of seniors has uh, had a great career here, uh, 64 and 5, um, which is, you know, very, very impressive. Uh, there's a lot of quality people. There's a lot of guys that are going to have graduated and will graduate, uh, and we're, we're proud of that. Uh, these guys have all represented the program in a first class way. You know, Western Carolina um, you know, presents a lot of problems for you. Um, they run a lot of options, and uh, they've been pretty effective at, at doing it. Um, and, you know, this game is really not about uh, who we're playing, but it's about us continuing to be able to sort of build and rebuild the identity that we want to play to as a team. Uh, because we'll have some players out, it's obviously going to oppor offer an opportunity some other players to get a chance to play and um, show what they can do in a game. Welcome back. Uh, we're glad you're here on a uh, late afternoon, Wednesday, middle of the week. Uh, we'll be in Athens on Friday. Look forward to uh, talking to you there. Jeff is in Chicago on this Wednesday. Hey, Jeff. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, look, I'm so glad you asked Bill Hancock the question that you just asked him about the name on the jersey and the brand meaning something because we, we all know what he does. We all know it does. I mean, he can sit here and uh, 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 and tell us that it doesn't but that's the you know that's bs i know that's bs i mean here's how i would tell you to ask it to him next time ask him if he can unequivocally say that in the first year of the playoff if baylor and tcu were texas in oklahoma that Ohio State would have passed those, either of those two schools in the in the final poll because I'm sorry that's that would not have happened if it was Texas or Oklahoma because it was Baylor and TCU that is the reason it happened and we'll we obviously unfortunately can never prove that and you know this is why as much as I want to say it's the four best teams it needs to be the four best teams. Because because of that, I, I'm almost willing to say let it just be conference champions, you know, even though I, the core of me thinks that's actually probably the wrong way to approach it. I mean, 
let's just let it be conference champions then because the, the, uh, in that scenario, a, a team without a name, without a brand name in college football is always going to get hosed. They are, just like how it affects point spreads. It affects point spreads the same way. Teams with a name, you know, it, it factors into it because of the betting public. I mean, so for him to sit there and say that that doesn't affect anything they do is just, I mean, it's false. It's what he has to say. I mean, it's what he has to say. Obviously, he's not going to come on here and say, oh, yeah, you're right, Paul. It does affect it. You know, we give, uh, you know, we give Alabama way more credence than we would give Mississippi State if they have the exact same resume. Because after all, it's Alabama. Look at their history and look at who their coach is and, and, and blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, no one's ever going to say that. That's why, that's why I think, you know, that's why this whole thing bothers people so much. And that's why as much as I don't want it to be conference champions, because you would have a playoff with not the five best teams or not the four best teams or not the six best teams. That's why I'm willing to say, just make it conference champions then. And then you, then at least you don't have to have this, this, this farce of a committee try, you know, trotting out there every week with the likes of Bill Hancock you know, saying, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's just such BS. You know it, too. I mean, I know you know it. And I, but, I'm look, I'm at least glad that you asked it, especially, you know, on the network that you asked it. It's important that someone at least is. So thank you there. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate it. Greg is up next. Uh, hey, Greg, how are you? Hey, Paul. Thank you. I'm doing well. Thanks for taking my call. You know, I think the problem that a lot of people have, maybe even Tim Brando, is that um, – <clears throat> the committee has objective criteria that they use subjectively uh, each week, and uh, the goalposts will always change. Now, the problem I have with taking a conference champion is what if that conference champion has three or four losses? Yeah, no. That's not uh, the best. And by the way, in the SEC, you got three legitimate teams uh, that are better than – Almost everyone else, but but maybe two or three other schools. Yeah. So to say that simply yeah, because I mean, you won, yeah, I mean that's ridiculous. I mean in basketball, uh, any any if you if you get in the tournament, you're one of sixty eight. You got you got a shot at winning. Exactly. So I, I think you know, uh, the, the more this goes on, the more I'm willing to believe that when it comes time to renegotiate the contract that. It's just as likely that they stay at four. And and if they do stay at four, Paul, what's that going to do to those who are the the, the curmudgeons uh, like Brando? What's that going to do to them uh, if they sign another 10-year deal that says we're going to keep it at four? Well, listen, what, you've what, heard me say this, and, and uh, you know, I say it because I, I, uh, I, you know, I think you know me pretty well, Greg. I mean, ESPN, which is my employer— is a partner with the college football playoff. And you know, they they have this television show every Tuesday night where the chairman comes on there and sounds like he's he's the official spokesperson for the Politburo. Uh, and, and it drives me crazy. And you know, I, I I I've been on that show many times following him and uh, and, and, and you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna waste three minutes of valuable airtime, say something. Give us some insight. You can you can give us an anecdote about the discussion. I mean, you're not you're, we're not talking about national security clearance here. We're talking about 13 people talk uh, talking about the same thing that you and I are talking about every day: college football. Yeah, it's not it's not life and death talk. No, not, it's not. I mean, uh, and, you know, I don't have a problem with him, you know, uh, with uh, Mullen saying, you know, listen, we had a conversation about Alabama. We don't really think their schedule is that great. I mean, this guy, everybody's great. Uh, I mean, <laughs> we watch both halves. Like, I mean, come on. I mean, I know, I know people is. on that committee, and uh, and you know, you know, listen, Brando made you know made made a point that I've made many many times. Give us some transparency. Well, that's if, an important if, thing. I mean, and by the way, just because I'll, you know, I mean, Hancock likes to throw it up. Well, you were on the mock committee. How many times have you heard somebody here or elsewhere say, you know, I served on that mock committee? Like, big deal, okay? 
Uh, I mean, I, I, have, I have to tell you, Greg, I was bored to death the day I, I was on the mock committee. Okay. <laughs> well, that's because you had you you were uh, hemmed in into a corner, and you were using old data from last year or the yeah. year that. Well, you no, it was like year five before. years ago. It was uh, I think we yeah. did two thousand and eight. And 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 by the way, all you're doing by inviting the media is giving them a day away from work, and 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 giving them carte blanche to act like. They've done something that, you know, my feeling is let, hey, let callers to the Feinbaum show serve on the committee, okay? And I mean, offered I mean, to uh, represent yeah. the, the Feinbaum show a couple years yeah, ago. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, they're, they're, I mean <laughs> if you're a member of the media right now and you haven't been on a mock, I mean, you're, you're, you're pretty irrelevant, okay? <laughs> and, and really, all this discussion about changing it is pretty irrelevant, too. It just fires everybody up. One last right. thing. Hey, Greg. hey, Greg, thanks for the call. We're up against a break. More to come as we continue here on a Wednesday.